Hey everybody, I've got a bunch of videos in the pipeline right now, but two are currently limited by weather, one is limited by physics, and one is limited because I'm editing it and I think it's kind of boring. But in the meantime, I thought that I would feature some actual science on the channel and show you some of my research, as opposed to just making videos about the machines that I use to do the research. This video is going to be a talk that I gave in January, actually, at a conference hosted by the Materials Research Laboratory here at UCSB. And I was really excited that I got to give a talk at this conference because it's a really wide-ranging audience, and it's really fun to be able to explain your work to people that are outside of your own little bubble, in my case, the little bubble of inorganic crystal growth. The upshot for YouTube is that I designed this talk for a more general audience of scientists as opposed to people like me that sit around and grow crystals all day and know all of the terminology already. I just rewatched it and I think that the most important bit of jargon that isn't immediately explained is the use of the phrase 3-5 or 4-6 semiconductor. A 3-5 material just means that it's a compound with an element from the third column of the periodic table and the fifth column of the periodic table stuck together. Gallium arsenide, for example, would be a 3-5 compound, and lead selenide, for example, would be a 4-6 compound. Anyways, I hope that you find it interesting, and if you have any questions, be sure to drop them below in the comments. I'm Brian Hay, I work for Penelmochy in the Materials Department here at UCSB. And uh, I'm very excited to be here at MRAP. Last year was my first MRAP, and I got to learn a lot about a lot of fields that I don't normally study, which was fun. Um, today I'm going to be telling you about some of our early research growing lead selenide on 3,5 substrates via MBE, or molecular beam epitaxy. And I think that I'm the only MBE talk here at MRAP this year, looking through the schedule. So this might be really heavy on the inorganic film growth, but I'm hoping that you all find it as interesting because I think it's a lot of fun. The first example, or I guess analogy that I want to make is probably my favorite way to think about the energetics of crystal growth, but it's also a, a, uh, an analogy that I'm hoping is going to land well here at MRAP. And heterotaxial crystal growth actually shares remarkable similarity with studies of interfaces in other systems, even liquid solid interfaces. So if we look at the interface between a water droplet beating up on a leaf, the shape of this droplet is actually governed by the surface energies involved. So in this case, there's a, there's a huge energetic penalty for every square inch that water is touching a leaf. And because of that, the water tries to beat up, and this whole system is trying to make that surface area as small as possible, and resulting in but <laughs> resulting in this shape. In thin film crystal growth, what you want is to be able to grow an extraordinarily thin layer of material. You want to be able to deposit like one monolayer of atoms that coats the entire surface, and then grow your second monolayer of atoms that coats the entire first monolayer of atoms. And it's going to sound like broad technology, but crystal growers actually refer to this as wetting the substrate. So the same way that water would wet a hydrophilic surface, if you have all the energetics of crystal growth working properly, you can wet a solid crystalline surface with a growing solid crystal, even though you know, neither of them are liquids. In this case, you can see that our lead selenide growing on gallium antimonide is not actually wetting the substrate. This is a droplet of lead selenide, or we normally refer to them as islands because they're solid, uh, on gallium antimonide. It's possible to get uh, liquid droplets on solid surfaces via MBE, but they're normally liquid metal, and it's normally a bad thing. So uh, even when you have solids growing on solids, you can still get all the same energetics. And I think that this is just a fantastic picture because we have a macroscopic photograph of a water droplet and an HRCEM micrograph of lead selenide doing the exact same thing on a scale where you can literally see individual atoms in the picture. So I think that's pretty neat. So today I'm going to be talking about one particular interface between two crystalline materials. And that is what happens when you try to grow a 4-6 rock salt on top of a 3-6 zinc blend material. So these two material systems don't like each other at all. 
There is a distinct difference in bonding character. We go from covalent bonding to sort of a mixed bonding, that I'm going to explain in a minute. There's a change in surface charge. The zinc land O01 surface is charged, and the rock salt O01 surface is neutral. And I think the most visual problem here is a change in coordination. We're going from a tetrahedrally bonded material to an octahedrally bonded material, which means that necessarily at that interface, you have to have at least one layer of extraordinarily unhappy atoms that are bonded to way too many things or way too few things in order to sort of reconcile that change in coordination from one material to the next. But, so I'm going to be talking a lot about this interface during the talk, but first I want to zoom out and talk about the 46 rock cells themselves. Uh, why do we want to study these materials? Why are we going through all of this trouble to nucleate this particular crystal structure? And we think that the 4-6 rock salts are going to be very efficient materials for infrared light uh, emission and detection. And uh, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you are, of course, ranging all the way from gamma rays out to radio waves. Very conveniently, most of the you know, valence sort of level electronic transitions in solids exist between like 100 million electron volts and like 10 electron volts. So when we're looking at light emission from semiconductors, we're actually looking at a pretty short section of this uh, spectra, extending from visible a little bit into the UV and a little bit into the infrared. Of course, visible light emission here at UCSB is uh, very popular because we have the Nakamura group and guy and nitride and the uh, uh, Nobel Prize for the uh, blue LED. So gallium nitride is a semiconductor with a 3.4 electron volt gamma, excuse me, a 3.4 electron volt band gap, which means that if you have an electron falling from the conduction band to the valence band, uh, it will emit a photon with 3.4 electron volts of energy. If you go a little farther into the infrared, just off the edge of the visible spectrum, you get two materials like gallium arsenide with a band gap of only 1.4 EV. And there's also a lot of research that takes place here at UCSB uh, from the Bowers group <coughs> in gallium arsenide. And where gallium nitride in the visible spectrum is great for solid state lighting, when you go a little bit in, into the infrared, uh, these materials are actually being studied for communication. You can make an infrared laser and you can shine that down with high optic cable with very low loss. If you want to go farther into the infrared, there is actually a lot of <laughs> fertile ground for applications in the realms of sensing and spectroscopy. But when you get out there, there are actually sort of multiple options for material systems that you can use to access uh, that range of the electromagnetic spectrum. The two examples that I want to compare to you today are the 3.5 materials and the 4.6 materials. So the 3.5s are much more heavily studied from the perspective of NDE and crystal growth. And Particularly, indium arsenide and timonide is a, an extremely narrow band gap material, so you can reach pretty far into the infrared with indium arsenide and timonide. But the 3 5 materials are limited because when you start to get to very narrow band gaps, they start to become less efficient. They start to have more problems with crystalline defects and they start to have higher loss. So, what I want to convince you over the next couple of slides is that the 4 6 materials are going to behave differently, and that we're going to be able to make efficient light emitters and detectors using lead sunlight and lead tin sunlight. So the first thing you should notice about the 4-6 materials is that 4 plus 6 does not in fact equal 8. So the 3 5 semiconductors, they're all tetrahedrally bonded. Every atom is touching four other atoms, and every formula unit has eight valence electrons. You can draw your AP chem Lewis dot diagram, and everything has eight valence electrons, and it's happy. The four sixes do not have that. They have a very different crystal structure. They're forming the rock salt crystal structure, and they have 10 valence electrons per formula unit, which means that the bonding in these materials is actually really kind of strange. It's actually quantifiably strange. Uh, if you plot a whole bunch of different materials with their bonding character, looking at the electron share versus electron transfer across their bonding, uh, the uh, indium arsenide and timonide, the 3 5 infrared material that I mentioned, is solidly up in the middle of the covalent bonding regime. But lead selenide, the 4 6 infrared material, is literally right in the center of this diagram almost equidistant between covalent metallic and ionic bonding. So, 
this means that the electronic structure of lead selenide is very different than the normal semiconductors that we study. And that allows it to sort of diverge from the trends and some of the limitations that are, uh, I don't want to say afflict, that's too strong, but that, uh, that can limit the 3.5 semiconductors. So I'm not going to explain what all of these things are, but effective, electron effective mass, static electric constant, and RJ recombination are properties of semiconductors that we look at to see how resilient defects they're going to be and how efficient they're going to be at emitting light. And all of the covalently bonded semiconductors are forming pretty significant trends here. And the four sixes just sort of ignore those trends and do their own thing. So in this particular case, the four sixes are going in good directions when they break all of these trends. But even if they weren't, the fact that they don't obey all of the rules of classically studied semiconductors, I think makes them very interesting and worth studying so that we can understand uh, why these materials can do what they do. At the same time, there's been sort of a resurgence in interest in these materials recently because uh, tin-rich alloys of lead tin selenide and lead tin telluride are quantum materials. They're uh, being investigated for things like topological quantum computing, which got mentioned briefly in the uh, the uh, quantum boundary talk yesterday. So that's just another promise, of, another part of the promise of the 4-6 material system. But all of this depends on actually being able to grow high quality films of the 4-6 materials. And we do that in this MBE. So MBE stands for molecular mean epitaxy. And I can tell you that the first time I saw one of these systems, I was sort of scared by it because there's like, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's hoses and cables and, you know, a massive block of stainless steel. But uh, honestly, most of it is just dedicated to pumping. There are seven different pumps on this system, and that's because MBE growth is an ultra high vacuum process. So we run this chamber like 10 to the minus 10 torque. So for the purposes of understanding an MBE talk, you really can ignore all of the pumping and all of the transfer equipment, and you really just need to look at what's happening in the growth chamber. And more than that, you really only need to care about what's happening in this simplified view of the growth chamber here. Uh, so, molecular beam, or MBE stands for molecular beam epitaxy. So, epitaxy meaning that we have a crystalline substrate and we are delivering to that substrate precursor material, which assumes the symmetry of the substrate and grows and forms its own crystalline structure. So, the molecular beam part is just how we deliver said precursor to the substrate. In this diagram here, I have the, uh, the substrate at the top, and we actually can heat that with the sample heater from above. And it's, so the, the free surface of the substrate is pointed down, so we're heating it from the back. And the other thing that I've labeled here are two effusion cells, uh, as lead selenide and tin selenide, since those are the two cells that see the most use in our actual system. So I'm sure that effusion cells are actually extraordinarily difficult to uh, design and build, but in function, they're actually very simple makes it great to explain during the talk. So you have a physical like chunk of source material, like a physical piece or powder of solid lead selenide that you put in a crucible. And all the effusion cell really does is heat up that crucible and cause the lead selenide to evaporate and fly out towards the substrate. Now, if you try to do this in air, it wouldn't work. The mean free path of a particle flying through air is something like 70 nanometers. Air doesn't seem like it's you know running into itself all the time, but it actually is. This chamber, operating under ultra-high vacuum, has a mean free path on the order of like kilometers. And the eagle-eyed viewer may notice that this chamber is not kilometers across, which means that the vast, vast majority of lead selenide molecules that are evaporated from this crucible travel to the substrate in a straight line without running into anything. And that gives us really, really precise control over the chemical species that land on the substrate and what happens when they get there. So there's no you know, ambient atmosphere that would do something like oxidize the free surface. In an MBE, you have sort of complete control over the interface. However, you don't have complete control over what the atoms actually do when they arrive. So in an ideal world, we would deposit you know, molecules of lead selenide and they form a nice ordered crystal on the substrate. But I sort of swept the substrate under the rug up till now. And I said it was going to provide some symmetry for the precursor, 
But the substrate, the choice of substrate is actually really, really important when you're doing MBE. And there are two real considerations that I want to talk about today. The first is crystal size and what we normally refer to as lattice mismatch. So uh, this is what receives the most attention from thin film growers on a regular basis. And uh, basically, if you have a cubic unit cell in your substrate and you're trying to grow a material on top that has a differently sized equilibrium cubic unit cell, eventually you're going to lose registry with the substrate. And you're either going to put crystalline defects in this material or you're going to have a significant amount of strain built up at this interface. And both of those can be bad things. So being able to get a substrate that is very similar in size to your film is a good thing. The other consideration that is probably less common, but in this particular material system we actually find to be pretty important, is surface chemistry. So you don't want a surface that will actually react with your precursor material. Uh, if you have some sort of exchange going on, the film that you're depositing is starting to react and sink into the material, it blurs out your interfaces and in worst case scenarios can actually cause your material to nucleate in the wrong orientation. The three substrates that we have been using for growth are three, it's a lot of numbers, three five substrates, so they're all from the three five system of semiconductors, uh, gallium arsenide, gallium semonide, and indium arsenide. And all of these materials have different surface chemistries and different lattice parameters, different sizes of their unit cells that uh, they present to lead selenide as we try to deposit this crystal structure on top of them. And, uh, I thought I was going to make it through this without copy. Um, yeah, so all of these materials uh, basically have different sizes and different chemistries that let us sort of separate these variables and see how those affect the growth of the uh, lead selenide crystal. Now, what I like to imagine in my head is having, like, you've got this in the arsenide surface, you've got one molecule of lead selenide flying into the infusion cell and it hits that surface. And at that point, what does it do? There are a lot of kinetic and thermodynamic considerations because it's going to bounce around on that surface. And this is the bonus slide that I added when Ram asked me to throw in something from, uh, from the YouTube channel. This is a, this is a simulation that is a completely different crystal structure. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm almost not sick anymore. So. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a completely different crystal structure, but this is really what I think of when I'm imagining crystal growth. Uh, this is a, it's not a flat surface like we get in NDE, it's just sort of a nanoparticle. But we have all of these atoms that are landing on the surface, and the surface is sort of continuously roiling, and all of these atoms are rearranging themselves. And crystal growth is actually an extraordinarily active process. You think of crystals as like, you know, hard, solid chunks, but it's not really what's going on. So when we actually try to grow lead cell, and I'll add some numbers to this diagram here. We have, I've labeled the substrate as indium arsenide. We're holding that indium arsenide at about 330 degrees, which means that all those atoms are going to be bouncing around and able to rearrange to some extent. And when we do this, and we try to grow lead cell line on this material, uh, a lot of it looks great, but every once in a while, some of it is crooked. Some of the material does not nucleate properly, and it basically generates the correct crystal structure, but that crystal structure is tilted. So what we want to see is a nice cube by cube orientation so that the film that's growing has incorporated all of the cubic symmetry of the substrate and is in line with it. And we see that over here, all of these light flat patches are the cube by cube orientation. I label one of them O1 here because that's the crystalline direction. However, we also get a whole bunch of nuclei that are tilted, and they are in the wrong orientation. And we get these triangular type nuclei, and we get these long rectangular nuclei. And we basically want to get rid of these, because we want to have single crystal growth. We don't want to have a whole bunch of different crystals that we're trying to you know, merge together to make these films. So uh, the really simple view of that growth is to raise the substrate to 330 degrees, turn on the lead cell line flux, and when that lead cell line sticks to the surface at 330 degrees, it sometimes tilts and misnucleates. And uh, we don't want to do that. However, I didn't explain to you why we pick 330 degrees. 
Uh, you may say, well, you know, make it hotter and it'll have more energy and it'll be able to rearrange itself because it won't be kinetically sort of frozen in place anymore. The problem with that is that we have a max temperature for lead cell line deposition. If you get above probably 350, 360, somewhere in there, the evaporation rate of lead cell line is actually higher than the deposition rate. So net, you will be removing material from your substrate instead of adding material from your substrate. Uh, but that, you know, didn't stop us from trying. So if you go to uh, 400 degrees and you turn lead, lead cell line flux on, you can get crystal growth and all of those lead cell line molecules that are bouncing around on the surface have the kinetic freedom to sort of rearrange themselves into a nice, you know, cubic template. Uh, the problem is that it is above the maximum temperature for lead cell line deposition, so we can really only grow like one monolayer of material by doing this. Because as soon as any more material tries to land on the surface, it just evaporates immediately because it's too hot. So uh, we sort of think of this now as a surface treatment bed, not a growth. So we take this up to 400 degrees, we shoot a whole bunch of lead cell line flux at it. Only one monolayer of that lead cell line flux sticks, but it sticks the right way. And then when we cool the material down, we can continue lead selenide growth at a low temperature and actually grow a nicely ordered film. So that is what we want to do. Uh, to add a little bit of, uh, uh, well, I want to say uh, quantitative results, but it is still just like pictures of the fraction of We have literally metric numbers. But uh, one of my favorite tools, the, one of the best things about MBE growth as a technique is that we can actually observe the surface during growth. So these are patterns from reflection high energy electron diffraction, or read, and this basically allows us to examine the periodicity of the surface while the crystal is being grown. And we can observe a change in the surface during the surface treatment at an elevated temperature, and then we observe another change in the surface when we actually start growing the lead selenide uh, crystal at a lower temperature. And we find that this is a very robust process and it results in this Q by Q orientation. And uh, this is an SEM micrograph of one of those resultant films. So we've actually cleaved this. So this is like a 45 degree tilted view that we're looking at here. And the indium arsenide really likes to cleave along this plane, but the lead cell line has a different unit cell. So it doesn't like to cleave along that plane, which is why it looks kind of jagged. But you can see that the surface is nice and flat. And despite actually breaking in a jagged way, the lead cell line film is very nice and even. So we were very happy that uh, this technique is able to result in such a nice film. We have also started to uh, fill out the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have lead cell line that emits at about 4 microns, which is pretty far into the infrared. And we've actually grown some lead tin cell line, an alloy with an even narrower band gap that emits at 8 microns which is very far into the infrared. Uh, well, far into the mid-infrared. I think far infrared is technically farther away. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so eight microns is a pretty long wavelength to, uh, to be coming out of a semiconductor like this. Uh, I also want to give a, uh, a special shout out to uh, Jan Watson's group at UT Austin for all of this PL. Uh, they have a great FJR setup that uh, allows us to look at this data. And they also uh, were able to compare some of our uh, material with similar wavelength emitting 3-5 material. So at the very beginning of the talk, I said that when you get into this long wavelength regime, you sort of have the choice between you know, a bunch of different material systems and the 3-5s and 4-6s are two of those choices. So these are 3-5 materials emitting at, you know, a little more than two and about five microns. And they are designed to emit light and to be, you know, efficient light emitters. Our lead selenide right now, uh, this sample was grown on gallium arsenide, uh, is at least on par with these results. And our films, I can tell you, uh, are single nucleated now, but they are still very full of crystalline defects. So the fact that we can get a strong photoluminescent signal out of these samples despite the fact that they have a lot of crystalline defects. Uh, we can't really yet say that it's defect tolerant. We haven't quantified that yet, but we can say that it looks very promising. And uh, I certainly will be wanting to explore this more in the future. So, uh, 
with this success, we were able to grow some pretty good films. We were able to get some good photoluminescence out of it. We wanted to understand what was actually happening at the interface. We wanted to understand how we were merging these two very dissimilar crystal systems. And for that, we turned to high resolution STEM. So I don't think I'll ever get tired of taking pictures of atoms. It's great fun. But uh, these are two orthogonally cut cross sections uh, that were fibbed out of a sample of lead selenide and indium arsenide. And I cut two at 90 degree angles such that we could sort of back project and you could figure out where every atom was along the interface. It's like doing uh, uh, tomography with only two pictures. But there's an awful lot we can learn from these images. But what I want to talk to you about first is the change in coordination. So I mentioned that somewhere in this structure, there had to be a really, really unhappy layer of atoms going from tetrahedral bonding to octahedral bonding. And as it turns out, that really, really unhappy layer of atoms is lead. So this is an actual lead atom I have sort of plucked out of this interface here. And it has five seleniums bonded to the top and two arsenics bonded to the bottom. So this is, this is not a low energy configuration. Uh, around this atom. There's, this is sort of a painful, a painful place for this thing to be. However, it seems to be the lowest energy configuration. So it's the cheapest despite being very expensive. And it does sort of make sense that either the lead or selenium species takes up the difference in this coordination. So the mixed bonding of the four six materials is much less directional than the really, really rigid tetrahedral covalent bonding in the substrate. So if we were going to change the coordination, it makes sense that the coordination changes on either the lead or selenium species. And in this case, with this particular interface, it is the lead atoms that do that. The other thing, if you're looking very closely at this diagram, you might notice is that these seleniums are not actually forming 90 degree angles with each other. So in the, in the rock salt, Unit cell, you know, everything is all 90 degree angles because it's basically a 3D record. But here they're not. And this is actually a structural distortion that we see in the selenium sublattice very close to the interface. So uh, this is, these are traces through, like, if you took a, a vertical line trace through this image and we're measuring exactly where every atom was, uh, you can see peaks for, you know, selenium and lead and selenium and lead. And what happens here is that the selenium sublattice and the lead sublattice sort of lose register. And we think that this is the result of a trapped layer of charge at the interface. So the substrate is indium arsenide here, and when you stop the substrate, when you truncate this crystal, you're either going to end on a layer of indium or a layer of arsenic, or a layer of indium. In this case, we're ending on a layer of arsenic, and that traps a bunch of negative charge at this interface which pushes on the more electronegative selenium sublattice. And the seleniums are sort of shoved away, and the lead are not shoved away. <laughs> and uh, it takes a long time for this offset to actually die out, and the material will start to look like regular rock salt again. So I don't imagine that this particular interface effect is going to be important for classical optoelectronics looking at you know, infrared applications of these materials. But I do think that it could be very important for the quantum applications of these materials to be extremely dependent on crystal symmetry. Because now we have a distortion that breaks one of the mirror symmetries in this material in the localized region of space right near the interface. So this is certainly not something that we expected to see when we started to investigate this interface. And I think it's a really interesting result. It's definitely something that we'll be keeping an eye on as we try to look towards some of the, uh, the quantum applications of these materials. So overall, through the, uh, the MERSEC-C project, we have been able to control the surface chemistry and the formation of interfaces between the 4-6 materials and the 3-5 materials. And uh, we've gotten some very interesting results. We've gotten some very promising photoluminescence data. Uh, but there's a lot more to do. So in the near future, we want to look a lot more at one-on-one -on -one oriented growth. So actually tilting the indium arsenide substrate to a different plane and then trying to nucleate lead selenide on yet another surface and trying to explore new interfaces. Uh, in this case, I, I removed 
uh, a lot of the one-on-one -on -one stuff from the talk because it was, there was a lot of it and it was going to be too long. But there was one bit that I wanted to include, and that's that we actually see the thermodynamically favored uh, confirmation across this interface is for the cubic symmetry to rotate 180 degrees as you pass through the interface. So the entire interface is like one massive stacking ball, which is just weird. It's really cool. And it's something that I want to look into a lot more. Uh, that's going to take some extra work. Uh, the next thing is to quantify defect tolerance. I said that it looks very promising. It looks like we are already making materials that are sort of reasonable light emitters in the mid-infrared. But uh, we need to do a lot more measurements to actually be able to quantify that and say how defect tolerant the materials are and predict how good the materials might get uh, if we you know, continue to develop and remove defects from them. The last thing uh, that I want to talk about are interfaces in these materials, specifically interfaces between uh, topological phases of these materials and trivial phases of these materials, and looking at uh, trying to measure uh, two-dimensional electron transport uh, that would make these materials very interesting uh, from a quantum computation perspective. So that is, I was, I was hoping that we were going to have some 2D transport data that I would be able to, to flash up for this slide here, but uh, then the ABU went down like a month ago and we weren't able to get any more samples out. So uh, this is coming very soon and I'm uh, very much looking forward to some of the results. And uh, with that, I thank you and I'll take any questions.